It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and joining us to talk about Advent and, of course, the end of the world is the host of the Renovo Podcast. Check it out, RenovoPodcast.com, Doug Tuke. Thanks for being here, Doug. Oh, such a pleasure. It's great. So I, the Advent and the Apocalypse, uh, I would say, is not something we normally think of whenever we're thinking of how do we prepare for Christmas, Advent, Advent reads. <laughs> what? You don't, have an, you don't have an Apocalypse read? Come on, Kyle. <laughs> well, <laughs> I will now. Now, <laughs> now you're setting right? the record straight. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I did a couple of podcasts on Advent and the end of the world, and I did them pretty close together a while back, and uh, I was kind of in fun with it. But then when I was working at a parish at the time, I, I did this great night with teens just about like, hey, do you realize that when you're waiting for the coming of Christ, you're also waiting for the second coming? And it's the same theology. Like, do you know that? And then, like, the te- we had a blast. We just had a great conversation. That was the inspiration for, for the conversation anyway, which yeah, is great. Which I think that's a connection we don't often make. I think we think of about right. the first coming, the coming of Christ, and that's what we're preparing for. So right. maybe first, before we get into why those are two are connected, why do you think we've lost that connection if that was supposed to be the intent from the beginning? Well, geez, how much time do we have? Uh, I mean, I, I think, I think the re- I mean, we love baby Jesus. I mean, we love the imagery. We love, we love the star. We love the wise men. We love the innocence of Christ coming into the world. I think it's terrifying to think about Christ coming back into the world because it's, it's just a declaration of accountability. I mean, for us. I mean, we have to believe or we don't. We have to believe what we say or we don't, which is we believe in the second coming. I mean, it's in the creed. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, then it demands that we act in a way that we say we are called to act. It's, it's actually the, the impetus behind the purple candles is a reminder to do good works. It's literally, it's, the color, it's, a, it's a collective color of prayer hmm. to remind us to act in a way that is, it is Christocentric. So there's a beautiful connection in the tradition, but there's also, you know, it's challenging for us because that means we have to look at each other and go, gosh, are we ready? Is this really, you know, it's not a funny coffee mug or a t-shirt. You know, look busy, Jesus is coming. It's more than that. It's like, no, no, no. I mean, are you are you really ready? And are you longing for it? I think that stirs emotion that people just don't like to talk about. Well, and I think, guess we can think of two different things. The end of time being the end of our earthly existence, the end of our life, the end of our time, and the second coming of Jesus, which are potentially two separate things, correct? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's good story behind that. I mean, we... Catholics don't believe in, in a rapture, in a, a period of, of cleansing. We believe in, in the second coming. And really, our, our language is that the world has been evangelized. It's actually a message of hope that the gospel has been shared, that, you know, this kingdom becomes the kingdom on earth, that it becomes an invitation to Christ. So, yeah, they can be two separate things. What's exciting about the, the Advent moment regarding last times is that it's a reminder to do the preparatory work. And, you know, we believe in eternal life. So, you know, what, what are we really afraid of except for losing the stuff we have, which is exactly what the Christmas message really challenges us with. You know, it's like, well, how much do we need to consume? How much material do we need to have? And are we really doing this the way Christ wanted us to do it? I like that challenge. And I like that it comes this time of year every year. I think it's, I think it's healthy for us disciples, that's for sure. Well, I want you to unpack that a little bit because I feel like the Christmas message is sometimes the exact opposite of that. Because we, <laughs> right. you know, it's, it's gift giving yeah, and I mean, getting church, things instead of you're saying like <laughs> you don't need all of that stuff. Well, it's the beauty of the countercultural nature of our church. Our, our church's message is not buy, 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 do, do, do. I mean, again, back to the reef. The reef is a light in dark places. It's the the advent. Uh, tradition is literally the darkness of winter. You know, it comes out of Scandinavia and Germany, where winters were very, very long. And the wreath itself was a reminder that even in darkness, we are to bring light. So the church's message at Christmas is give, 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 give it all, give away, give the widow's pence, you know, lift up the poor. It's, It's the hallmark special in many ways. It's not run out and do the shopping and consuming. So you can see where culture and countercultural meet, and it really, it really is kind of spectacular in the name of church. So, yeah, you do have two messages. 
But the tradition of the church has been one that's pretty consistent over time, and I think way more challenging. It's harder for us to say, wait a minute, we don't need more stuff. What we need to do is live up to the, the nature of light in dark places and then be the witnesses of faith that we were called to be. So, yeah, it should be a time of tension. Um, and I think that tension sometimes really gets to folks. I think it gets to people. This Advent season, as we prepare for Christmas, whatever that means in our own lives of what, what it means that we're actually preparing and how we do that and, and what we're actually preparing for, how would this be done in tandem with preparing for the end times? Well, you know, if I'm sitting down, and I'm having a conversation with my family. We had, we had dinner last night together, and we had that conversation. My daughters were just very uncomfortable as young teenage women with this idea of Christ coming again. So we talked about it, and I said, you know, so how do you think the world felt when Christ was born in a manger, you know, when he literally came to this world in a food trough? And there was an expectation of one thing, and then there was God's delivery of another thing. And we had a great chat about it, because I was like, well, where are you at in your faith right now? You know, like, are you in a place where you are peacefully walking with the intentions of the Lord in your life, whatever that is, to love, to be peaceful, to serve, you know, the works of mercy, literally? Or are you, are you terrified of it, consumed with self, and it would be embarrassed to greet your king? I mean, if you're embarrassed to greet your king, it's the same in the nativity as it would be in the second coming. You are not doing what Christ calls you to do, to be who he calls you to be. And that's a, that's a beautiful invitation and an intense invitation to service and accountability. I loved it. My daughters were awesome. They're like, I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, what would it take to be ready? And then they were like, oh, I should go to confession. I'm like, well, we should do that anyway. You know I mean? Like, and we just had this great conversation about making our lives less about self and more about other, which of course is the, that's the golden rule. It's the gospel in the first place. And that that's a way for us to really live the Christmas spirit and the Advent spirit. I think a lot of people think those two things are really different. I think they're actually really similar. And to prepare ourselves for the coming of the king, both as a baby and as the king, as the one who leaves the throne behind and, and walks with us. I like it. I like that conversation because I think it's more of a mature kind of adult way to say, how is my discipleship going? And am I really ready to receive him? And, uh, you know, Catholics, we do that at Eucharist, but it's also part of our end times plan is to receive him. And I like that. And I hope my kids like it. I hope that they, they kind of hold themselves accountable in that way. We're talking with Doug Took. His podcast is Renovo, R-E-N-O-V-O, and he breaks down stuff like this all the time. In fact, this was the topic of episode 22, which was uh, actually two years ago. We talked about the end of the world. Such a great episode. And I think whenever we talk about the end of the world, the end times, the second coming, this gets really confusing, and you've talked a little bit about it, but what do we know about the second coming and what is maybe uh, guesses, educated guesses or legends that we believe to be true? <laughs> That's bold. That's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, Cause well, you said you know, we, we don't, as Catholics, we don't believe in the uh, rapture, the rapture or what we, what we, what, yeah. I mean, you know, you remember the left behind series, right. in the 90s, we all got stirred up. <laughs> I, here's the, I mean, the short and sweet answer to that is, we really have embraced basically St. Augustine's City of God. I mean, that, that would really be the answer, the, okay. the, the idea of, of, of like, you know, we expect the church and the gospel to spread to the entire world before the end comes and really encompass the entire earth in what Augustine calls the City of God, the kingdom of God. We, we, we say that, we talk about it. But then you also have Matthew 24, 10, Timothy 3, Daniel 12. I mean, you have all these, like, scripture passages that outline language of expectation. Hmm. And we would believe in our tradition that those passages that are used by our non-denominational brothers and sisters many times to sort of paint a little bit of a portrait of fear, we kind of believe, well, a lot of that stuff has already happened. Famine has already happened. Tyrannical leaders have already happened. Right. Peter talks specifically about the scoffers the last days of scoffing, they're following their own sinful desires. That, that stuff has happened for centuries. It's not like those are new or prophetic in nature. But my favorite one is, <clears throat> excuse me, Timothy 3. He says, understand that in the last days there will come a time of difficulty. People, I love this, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, 
unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I'm like, well. Sounds like Facebook. <laughs> that's kind of today. <laughs> it's basically Twitter. Yeah, right? my Twitter feed. <laughs> right? so, I mean, so we, you know, we look at that and we just kind of go, well, I mean, that's the context of, of who we are as people, cultural sometimes, right. and that we have this countercultural message that says, wait a minute, in the midst of that is light. In the midst of that, darkness fails. In the midst of that, we are to build a place for the kingdom. And that kind of stuff gets me ramped up because it makes me feel like, oh, I, the mission is clear. The mission is very clear to, to live Advent, to live preparation for both the coming and the second coming, because that's what it's always been. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And that, that just, it's not complicated. It's just hard. It's hard work. Right. So what would be some practicals? You mentioned confession, which would be a great thing to do this Advent. Yeah. Sharing. What are some other things that we can practically do to kind of kill two birds with one stone, prepare for Christmas and prepare for the end of the world? Well, <laughs> dig a hole in the ground, <laughs> go, buy to, go to Costco. No, uh, I mean, my, I'm a broken record when it comes to that. I, I, you know, we got to ramp up our prayer life, you know, as Catholics. Listen, we want to evangelize the world. We want to prepare the kingdom. It's one thing to understand apologetics. I get it. But it's another thing. We need to know the word. We need to know the word. We need to be scripture scholars. I think that Catholics need to dig into the dailies. I think if you, if you make one Advent promise would be maybe sink your teeth into the gospel each day. Literally, the gospel for the day. I mean, you can have it read to you for crying out loud. There's so many Catholic apps. It's ridiculous. Just get into that language his language that he gives us in scripture. And when we have those difficult conversations with strangers, or we have those conversations with our family or our non-denominational brothers and sisters, we're at least speaking the given language, which is scripture. And I just, oh my gosh, I think a Catholic church that understands the word, you better buckle up. The Reformation is over. I mean, you are going to evangelize the world. And it's so simple. We just don't do it. And I'm talking a little, just a little bit each day to just expand our vocabulary of faith. And I think that's really practical. And of course, you know, frequent the sacraments. Yeah. This is a time of, of longing. And I think that that, I actually think that's easy. That's like, that's something that's just given to you. It's just a matter of giving your most precious commodity, which is time. But I think we need to ramp up our prayer lives. We need to invite our mother into that process and we need to listen to the word. I think it's the most important thing we can do. Well, this has been such a great conversation, and I always love having you on. Just you have such great wisdom, and it fits in so well with our Advent theme and to to really challenge us. Uh, but really, I also wanted to just promote your podcast for people that aren't checking this out. You you cover such great topics. Just uh, the couple of recent ones of the Soul, the California Missions, Why Popes, Dante, so many great things. Relativism. I mean, all of these. Great topics that you just break down really quickly and concisely and thoroughly in the podcast. So people check out renovopodcast.com, wherever you get podcasts. You've also merged the podcast with your work that you're doing with ODB Films. So can you explain yeah. what ODB Films is and some of the projects you're working on? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I, I'm just, I am so blessed to get to work with ODD Films. We're the, we're the producers of Paul the Apostle of Christ, which came out last spring. So good. In collaboration with Sony Affirm Films. We had such a blast making that. And there's, there's, there's a limit to what I could talk about, but I can tell you this. We've got some serious irons in the fire. There are some incredible projects coming up that I just cannot wait for the world to see. I am the director of ministry for ODB Films. We're a, we're a nonprofit company in the Diocese of Rockford, Illinois, consecrated to Mary. Um, it's just a beautiful company. We're working on a project called the Encounter Series that is going to blow your mind. It's a series of short films telling the stories of holiness in the United States, from clergy to laity to our women religious, just incredible stories that the world is going to be, it's going to blow your mind. And we're just going out to the periphery to show living holiness. We're looking for that to come out next fall. Um, every, everything there is in production. Our incredible director of operations, Katie Reedy, is actually in the field shooting all throughout the holidays. Eric Groth, the executive director of ODB, and T.J. Bearden, our lead producer and vice president, have gotten big you know, box office scripts being developed, a couple of stories of holy folks, and uh, it's been a pleasure. I kind of brought the, I brought the podcast to Eric and said, hey, I do this thing. Is it something that ODB would like? To promote, and he said, absolutely, gave me some new equipment, which those of us that live in the radio recording world always appreciate new yeah. equipment, which was great. Uh, and then I just got to kind of make sure it just fits into the mission of ODB, which is to serve 
those believers, especially four rows back, three seats in. Let's take complicated topics and unpack them in a way that inspires hearts. But also, you know, our thing is artfully made, spiritually rich films. Well, we also, it's artfully made, spiritually rich media. Yeah. You know, we want it to be life-giving for everybody that listens, just like Catholic Radio, and learn. I, I think that there's a learning curve with Catholics. I think that we've, we're a little broken there, and I think it needs to be simple and accessible. We keep the podcast short. It's a run. It's a workout. It's a commute. It's not a droning on hour-long podcast. I love that about the show. also forces me when I write to really get it in there quickly and not just drone on. And that, that's a challenge and a good one. It's been a, it's been a blast. I love the show. It's, it's a good to do. All right. Check out the podcast, RenewablePodcast.com. Check out ODB Films for events, uh, links to uh, other podcasts and films and all that's going on with them. ODBFilms.com. And special thanks to Doug Tuke. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kyle. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Blessed Advent to you. You as well. <laughs>